Hello and assalamu alaikum everyone. A very warm welcome to the day one of the Advanced Audit and Assurance Webinar to Success for Exams in September 2022. And I am your tutor, Kashif Kamran. Now, just before starting the proceeding for the first day, I would just like to introduce myself and my social media presence before we can take on the agenda and the proceedings for the day one of this webinar. Now, in terms of my tutor profile, I am Kashif Kamran, a fellow chartered certified accountant. And in terms of my teaching experience, it's been more than 15 years since I am teaching the ACCA qualification. And my core specialization lies in the AA paper, the AAA paper, and the SBL paper. I'm also a registered mentor for Oxford Brooks University Research Analysis Project. I currently own and heads my own setup. Uh, which is the Online Lecturers Academy, also known as Kashif Kamran's Digital Learning. I'm also associated with PAC, which is a gold approved learning provider for ACCA in Lahore, Pakistan. And in India, I am connected with Civit College. In terms of my webinars and experience and exposures, uh, I've conducted 14 AAA webinars with ACCA Pakistan. That is the highest uh, any teacher has taken with ACCA. And this is my third webinar I am doing from my own setup known as Webinar to Success. I did for the December 21 exams, then I did for the June 22 exam, and this is for the September 22 exams. So in all, this is my 17th webinar I'm taking for AAA. Now, in terms of my social media presence, this is extremely important. The recordings of this webinar will be available on my YouTube channel and you should be following it because lots of uh, recent updates have been there on my YouTube channel in terms of the recent developments ahead of the September 22 exams for AAA. So you need to be on this channel for all the updates and you will regret if you miss any of the updates and you are unaware of that before you are appearing for your September 22 exam. So please do subscribe to my YouTube channel. In terms of my other social media presence, uh, you can follow me on my Facebook. You can follow me on the Instagram. You can follow me on the LinkedIn and on my website, which is kashifkamran.com. You can e email me any queries, any issues at my email ID, or you can be in touch with me uh, on the WhatsApp. And I hope lots of you are in the student WhatsApp group interacting with me on a daily basis. Now, with all that, let's start with the day one of this webinar to success for September 22 exams. Let's see what I have in store for all of you for the very first day. Now, the very first thing before we move on to the agenda of the day one and start discussing the agenda and put more specific time to that, I would just like to discuss a, a, a quick word on objective pass rates and paper format. Because uh, if you are preparing for exams uh, for September with 14 days away, you should be very clear with the paper structure and the challenges inside the AAA paper. Now, in terms of the objective of this webinar, uh, the objective is to bring you closer to the mindset of the examiner. And that is the most important thing you all have to do, because the closer you are to the mindset of the examiner, the better chances you have of success. So this webinar, just like the previous one, will bring you closer to the mindset of the examiner. What is exactly going in the examiner mindset? What the examiner expects from all of you? Uh, what you should do to pass the AAA paper. That sets the more important question at this point in time. So the next four days, lots of guidance, lots of tips, lots of techniques, lots of fine tunings, lots of motivations, and lots of uh, brainstorming, which will bring you closer to that mindset of the examiner. And I'll just spell out the agenda for the next four days. So you exactly know what will be happening in the four days in store for this webinar. The webinar to success will mitigate your misconceptions. And there is a greater misconception now around the professional marks because that's something new for the September 22 exams. And that's where most of the students have the misconceptions. So I would try to focus a lot on professional marks over the next four days. So let's start. Let's start this webinar. 
Now, if you look at the pass rates, uh, the pass rates have not been very encouraging for the AAA paper. And you know, there has been a downtrend in the pass rates for the AAA paper, and it's going down. If you look at the last exam sitting June 22, where the official results are available, it's 31 person. And you know, I already did a session on my YouTube uh, for the reasons behind the low passing rates in June 22. I hope you've watched that video on my YouTube channel. And I also did another video for reasons behind failure, because see, this is a crucial time where you have exams, which are just 14 days away. You need to ensure that you know the reasons. You know the reasons why student fail in a AAA paper. Because if you don't know the reasons why you fail in the AAA paper, you will do the same mistake. And I don't want you to repeat that. So it is extremely important that you look at these pass rates, you look at the challenge behind these pass rates, and you assure that you want to be successful. Now, again, there is a myth uh, which, it, which is now existing among a student community. Uh, and every day I get questions from students asking, will the pass rate improve? Will the paper become easier with the 20 professional marks coming in? And I say to a student, if you were failing in the AAA paper before, uh, the situation might still remain the same till the time you don't understand that you need to write a case-specific answer. You, if you want to attain the 20 professional marks, and if you want to ensure that those 20 professional marks increase the chances of your success, you need to understand uh, my webinar day one today in terms of a checklist of gaining those 20 professional marks, because it is not that easy formula that with the 20 professional marks coming in, and you start to believe that the pass rate will jump from 31% to 51% in the upcoming exams, no. I do foresee a slight improvement, but I don't see a dramatic improvement coming in the AAA passing rate because again, the 80 technical marks, uh, if you are spoiling that and you, you don't have an ability to write a good answer, you don't have an ability to absorb the case study in your answer, the problem remains the same because till the time you are not upholding the quality of your answer. You are not upholding the quality threshold of your answer. You, the, 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 the problem remains the same. The situation remains the same. So I'll, I'll be investigating that more, uh, that the challenges are there, but the challenges needs to be overcome. Particularly for the June 22 exams, the low pass rates, uh, please ensure that you watch this video on my YouTube channel, Analyzing Failure in AAA in the last 14 days ahead of your exams, this might change your mindset. Because in this video, I have specifically covered the reasons. I've specifically covered what you need to do to investigate the failures in AAA paper. And honestly, this video will change the way you look at the AAA paper. And if you, if you look at, if you watch this video and what has been uh, mentioned in this video, if you do that, that will really change the way you are attacking the paper on the 5th of September. So please take a time out, watch this 30, 30 40 minutes video, uh, and this will change the way you're looking at the pa paper, which is upcoming. Now, moving onwards, there is a frequently asked question. There is a frequently asked question, uh, which I am getting since last many weeks now. And the question is, is the AAA paper format changed for September 22 exams or from September 22 exam? The answer to this question is no. The paper format has not changed. It's only that the AAA examining team has introduced 20 professional marks in the paper. The format of the paper has not changed. You still have three questions all three mandatory questions, one in section A, two in section B, that has not changed. The only thing is the split of marks, the technical marks versus the professional marks. So the paper format is the same. It's only that the 20 professional marks have come in and the technical marks have gone down to 80. Let's see the format of the paper quickly. Now, this is how the paper would look like. You still have one question in section A, the big one, 
where you have 40 technical marks and 10 professional marks. Then in the question two and question three, which is in the section B, each one of them has 20 technical marks and five professional marks. And I hope you all know there are four professional skills which you all have to demonstrate across in the AAA paper in the question number one, two, and three. In the question number one, you are demonstrating all the four skills, which includes the communication skill. And in the question number two and three, you are demonstrating the three remaining skills, not the communication skill. Communication skill is only part of the first question. So you will only find the communication skill along with the other three skills in the first question. But in the question number two and three, you will find the three skills minus communication. So this is how the paper looks like. So the format has not changed. It's just the split of technical and professional marks, which are making the way for the first time, starting from the September 2022 exams. And that's where the, the problem is. That's where the issue is coming from the student community, uh, the understandability of the 20 professional marks. And I hope this four days of the webinar will bring clarification to that. Now, moving on and looking at the syllabus versus the AAA paper, with 14 days away the paper, uh, you should have a holistic overview that how confident you are in the syllabus areas, which uh, really have a powerful impact on a 100 marks paper. Now, when you look at the section A of the paper, uh, which is the 50 marks question, where 40 are technical and 10 are professional marks, Syllabus area D contributes heavily in the section A, question number one, which is planning and audit of historical financial statement will only reflect in question one. You don't find syllabus area D in section B, right? You only find syllabus area D in section A of the paper. And that's where you need to be very strong. So you need to ask this question to yourself, how confident you are in syllabus area D now when exams are 14 days away. Now, we know there are two things which comes from syllabus area D in question number one. Number one is audit risk or the risk of material misstatement or the business risk. And the second thing which comes from the syllabus area D in the question number one is the audit procedures, because that's part of the syllabus area D, audit of historical financial statements. So you should be good on the area of risk. You should be good on the areas of procedures. These are two very important areas in a 100 marks paper, and they are reflected in the section. We know procedures uh, for other areas, procedures like procedures for forensic and procedures for other assignments, procedures for due diligence, procedure for prospective financial information, they can come in section B because they are from the different syllabus areas. But uh, procedures on accounting matters, procedures on accounting treatments will only be reflected in the question number one. So section A, that's the major part. Section B, two syllabus areas where you have to be very, very strong. Syllabus area E, because that will be reflected only in section B, one of the question. You will never find E in section A. You will always find E in section B in one of the question, either two or three. Mostly it's three now. And other assignments. You know the breakup of other assignments. You know how critical other assignments have been in the past paper. Primarily, lots of questions on review of prospective financial information. Even in the mock exam for September 22, there is a question on review of prospective financial information. And we know examiner has a tendency of asking review of prospective financial in information more than any other assignments. Due diligence is also important. Due diligence has also come a number of times in the recent past papers. So that's another important area. And so is a forensic, a very important area. And there are many other assignments as well. Two areas, right? Other assignments and completion, review, and reporting. A question on audit evidence, finding a question on evidence, finding a question on reporting, finding a question on going concern, finding a question on communication, communication to those charged with governance and finding a question on other assignments. This is something very typical in the section B. So if you are looking at section B and I, I'm looking at myself 14 days 
before exams, I'll be asking a question to myself, risk, procedures, evidence, report, going concern, communication to those charged with governance and other assignments. This is becoming seven. How good am I? How good am I in these areas? Because they are the one which have a significant impact on a hundred marks paper. So section B of the paper and section A of the paper, you should know which syllabus areas are the most important ones and how much time have you given on them and how much good you are in these three syllabus area. So syllabus area D, E, F. This is like the core. This is like the core of the AAA. I hope you're all clear with that, right? Okay, now moving towards the other syllabus areas, A, B, C. Syllabus area A, which is the regulatory environment, B, the ethical and professional issues, and C, the quality control and practice management, they can be tested anywhere in the paper. Now we know this term control has changed with management. I've just did that video on the new article on ISQM1. I hope you've watched that and I'll be guiding you on that in the session today. The term control has been changed with management so in the exam, even you will find the term management, not control. Syllabus so area C, B and A, they can be anywhere in the paper. We know questions on, questions on using the work of others from syllabus so area A is very popular using the work of an expert, using the work of an internal auditor, using the work of an, a component auditor. It's very common. Questions on auditor responsibility for laws and regulations. This is very common. Questions on money laundering is very common. Uh, questions on advantages and disadvantages of joint audit has been common in the past papers. So this is the regulatory area. This is the regulatory environment area where the questions comes from the knowledge part of the AAA. Ethical and professional issues, we know that is such a phenomenal area for AAA. You also find ethical and professional issues in the section A, the first question. You do find ethical and professional issues even in section B. And quality management and practice management. We know practice management in the recent attempts has been very popular. Examiner asking you uh, matters uh, you should consider in accepting a new client and that Practice management has become real, real important in the last five to six exam settings. Uh, I would believe that you should be sound on practice management. And I'll be discussing one question on practice management on the day two of the webinar as well. So these are critical areas, right, where you should be very, very strong at. Now, this is not, this is not the whole syllabus, but this is the core paper for AAA. This is the core paper for AAA, which you need to understand. So this is important. Now I'll just make a summary of that quickly before we proceed further. And syllabus area G, current issue, only when an examining team writes an article, that's the theory, that's been the history. Only when the examining team writes an article, then only you get the current issue in the AAA paper. But this time, if you have seen the mock exam, the September 22 mock exam on the practice platform, the September 22 mock exam consists of an eight marks question on climate risk. And climate risk is a current issue. Article has not been published, but I've already done a video on climate risk. You cannot ignore climate risk and go to the exam hall. Despite the fact there is a question in the mock paper, what if the same question comes in the exam setting? And this do happen. You have to take the mock exam seriously. You have to take the mock exam seriously. So climate risk is the emerging issue. There is no article, but this is an important current issue. And I've done a video on that. I've guided what you should be knowing about climate risk for the upcoming exams. So this is the paper. This is the syllabus. This is where the command has to be. So if I'm preparing for myself uh, for the 5th of September, this is what I should be focusing on. Now, everything I write on the Word file that will be shared with you. Uh, I'll convert this to the PDF and we'll share that with you. So nothing to worry about. This is the first day and this is how I will be writing things down every day. Now for the first day, when I'm looking at the core syllabus versus preparation versus preparation, I need to ask a question to myself, how good I am in these areas. 
how good I am in audit risk, how good I am in the risk of material misstatement, because that's one of the same thing uh, with the exception of detection risk. So I'm writing them at one point, material misstatement. How good am I in the business risk? How good I am in audit procedures? How good I am in areas like uh, the uh, audit evidence? How good I am in a question on going concern? How good I am in a question on report, audit report? How good I am in a question on communication to those charged with governance? Um, how good I am on a review of prospective financial information, because that's the more popular with the examiner. How good I am with the due diligence review, how good I am with forensic, because these are the popular ones, right? How good I am with the areas of uh, methods uh, in considering whether to accept a new audit client or not. Very famous question, very popular question with examiner in the recent history of AAA. Then the ethical and professional issues, how good you are on this side, how good you are in the areas of money laundering, how good you are in the areas of uh, auditor responsibilities, auditor responsibilities for fraud, auditor responsibilities for laws and regulations, uh, auditor responsibility for non-compliance with laws, sorry, auditor responsibility with laws and regulations, the non-compliance with laws and regulations, and the auditor responsibility for opening balances. How good you are with using the work of others, using the work of others, in terms of expert, in terms of component auditor. Component auditor has been very uh, popular with examining team and internal auditor. How good you are in areas of uh, quality management, uh, previously known as quality control, previously known as quality control. That is it, 16. A list of 16, check yourself, check yourself. After the end of the day one, take a printout of this file and check which of these areas I am weak at, which of these areas I have done less practice and how I can improve upon in the next two weeks. Now, this area matters in accepting a new client or not has been uh, very popular in recent exam settings. Component auditor has been very popular in recent exam settings. Uh, you need to be very focal on that. We know review of prospective financial information has been very popular in recent exam settings. Um, other areas are just the same. Other areas have a tendency of coming. But recently we have seen a more focus of the examiner in areas number eight, 11 and 15B. I hope this list will help you, right? In terms of your preparation, Core syllabus areas versus preparation, right? So this list will help you uh, doing a self-check, self-check where you stand. Is that clear to all of you? Can I get your yes and no answers quickly? Is this list clear? Okay, thank you so much for that. So just please take a printout and reconcile yourself. Okay, now just moving backwards to my presentation again. We were discussing the paper and the syllabus. Now it's so important to understand the paper. Uh, at this point in time, an exam the 14 days away, you should take command of the paper. You should know what comes in section A. You should know what comes in section B. You should know how important is syllabus area D, E, F, and you should know how, uh, how haphazard is ABC. ABC can come anywhere in the paper but you should be good. I, I'm just missing out one area from my list. Uh, just let me go on my Word file. Uh, this ha there has to be an area number 17, uh, which is the current issue, uh, current issue, which is the climate risk. So that has to be in that as well. And we've already done a video on my YouTube channel. I'll be sharing a link of that with you. So there are a total of 17 areas, not 16. 
Okay, just taking the final perspective now. Question number one, quickly. Question number one is set at the planning stage of the audit, and that's the reason the syllabus area D is important. A question worth 40 technical marks and 10 professional marks. Professional skills of communication, that is something additional. Commercial acumen, evaluation and judgment and analysis and skepticism will be demonstrated in the question number one. So you need to demonstrate all four of them. Now on the day two, which is tomorrow, I will be helping you with this demonstration because I will be looking inside the question number one of the mock exam. And I'll, I'll be telling you how would you be drilling uh, the question one and how would you be demonstrating these skills? But what is an extra skill in question number one, which is not in the other questions? Communication. So communication is an extra skill here plus, but the other skills, commercial acumen, evaluation and judgment and analysis and skepticism is what you have in the section B as well. So four skills, right? In the first question, the question may cover an individual company or a group situation. We know group, uh, the group audits or the group has been more popular in the first question in the recent history. The information that will be provided to you in the question number one in the form of exhibits will contain the background information. I hope you're very familiar with the exhibits which comes in the question number one. I'll be covering them in detail tomorrow, but there is, uh, there is a very static definition of exhibits in the question number one. Uh, the first exhibit is the partner email. I hope you're familiar with that. The second exhibit is more about the background information of the company. The third exhibit is mostly like the financial statement extracts. And the fourth exhibit is something very specific. It could be some ethical and professional issues in the fourth exhibit. It could be uh, the joint audit in the fourth, ex uh, fourth exhibit. It could be something very particular like, like the climatical risk in the fourth exhibit. So the fourth exhibit or the fifth exhibit, whatever that is, examiner keeps for something very specific. But the first exhibit is always a partner email, which contains the requirement. The second exhibit is the background information of the company, which from where most of the risk can be identified. The third exhibit is the extracts of the financial statement, which also help you in identifying the risk and the ratios and the trends and the, what is going up and what is coming down in, in that context. So there are very particular exhibits, right, which comes in the question number one. And you should be knowing how static those exhibits are, right, by, by this point in time when exams are 14 days away. Syllabus area A, B, C, D can be tested in the question number one. We have just thought of that. D is a most important area. D is the dominated area in the question number one. But apart from D, ABC can also be part of the question number one because ABC can be tested anywhere in the exam paper. Further requirements like ethical and professional issues using the work of others, matters in accepting a new client or an engagement are regularly tested in question number one. So in question number one, you can also find syllabus area C, practice management. You can find ethical and professional issues. You can find using the work of others in the question number one. So please be clear, what is the definition of question number one? Because if you are unclear with the definition of question number one, you will face challenges. You will face pressure in the real exam. But if you are clear with what question number one consists of, you are clear that what are regular, regularly examined areas in the question number one, you will be very relaxed uh, in the exam hall on the 5th of September. You exactly know what the question consists of. So please be sure of the first question. Any current issue can also be tested in the question number one, depending uh, what is the nature of the current issue. Current issue can be tested in section A as well as in section B, depending upon what is the nature of the current issue. In the mock exam, uh, the climate risk current issue is in the question number one. Question two and three quickly. Section B of the AAA paper consists of two questions, each of 20 technical marks and five professional marks. The professional skills of commercial acumen, analysis and skepticism and evaluation and judgment will be tested in this section. One of the question in section B must be from a reporting stage, completion and reporting stage. So one of the question has to be from syllabus area C. Can a syllabus area E omit from section B? Never. Can a syllabus area E omit from section B? Never. Can a syllabus area F omit from section B? Yes. E is the most important area. E is the most important area when it comes to section B because one of the question has to be from E. F can come, cannot come. 
So syllabus area E is the dominating one, right? Typical questions, I've just given you the typical questions, evidence, going concern, communication of matters, critical appraisal of the report, et cetera, are the more common questions you must have seen in the section B. The other questions in section B uh, is more open, can come from anywhere, where examining team can test any syllabus area like A, B, C. Mostly syllabus area F is also examined in the section B. So one of the question in section B, we know one of them has to be from completion and reporting, right? But one of them can be from A, B, C, or F. So A, B, C, or F, right, can make the other question. But mostly, mostly it's around F. Not every time, but mostly. So are you all clear by now? How important is the syllabus area DEF? Can I get your answers? And how, how confident you are on syllabus area D, E, and F? If you are doing my, uh, if you're taking my course, if you are my regular student, block three and block four. Block three and block four, right? Is the critical one. So if, how good you are on block three and block four, because that, that is where I cover the syllabus area D, E, and F. That's the most important area. So please ensure you self-check yourself ahead of your exams coming up. So this is an analysis of the paper. And I hope this analysis at this point in time must be beneficial for all of you. Because this webinar is not just for my registered students. This is for every AAA student appearing for the exam. So there might be many who, who are doing self-study. And this analysis of question one, two, three will be beneficial for all of them. Okay, now let's move on and comes to the main thing, agenda of the webinar. Now that's where the core webinar is starting finally. Now look, let's look at the agenda. On the day one, which is today, new developments taking place ahead of the September exams and are you fully aware of that? Number one, boosting professional marks. How would you boost the 20 professional marks? How would you gain the 20 professional marks? Time management. How would you allocate 195 minutes? And what will be the new time management considering there are professional marks in the paper? And write study planner for 14 days. One, four, 14 days. That's all in the day one. Then day two, day three, day four, we are investigating the question number one of the mock exam, then the question two of the mock exam, and then the question three of the mock exam. Not just the questions, marking scheme. <laughs> Sorry for that. The marking schemes. Uh, any changes in the marking scheme? Uh, when we are discussing the question one, two, and three, we are also drilling the professional skills. We are also understanding the ability to gain professional marks. So it's not just we are discussing the question one and two and three. We are also investigating demonstration of professional skills. We are also investigating the marking schemes. We are also investigating any changes in the, in the way the question number one, two, and three are set in. Any change of language, any change of requirements will all be evaluated on the day two, day three, and day four. So very, very important day two, day three, day four. But let's first look at the first day. New developments, day one. Now looking at the new developments on the first day, It's been very excited one month, August, for me as a tutor, for you as a student, and for the examining team, because lots of things have come up ahead of the September 22 exams. And the students were asking me, uh, why is the examining team making us so burdened? No, examining team is not making you burdened, because first of all, you need to understand that everything new coming up in August, not necessarily it gets examined in September. But yes, we have to be risk averse. We, we need to be risk averse. It could be tested. But not necessarily everything coming up in August impacts the September 22 paper. The 20 professional marks is a must. Now that change was brought since you started the syllabus, since you started the course three months ago, four months ago, you were all aware after the June exams were over, you were all aware that there are 20 professional marks in AAA from September. 
So that's not a big change because you are prepared for that. But yes, the recent updates, the recent articles, the recent change of terminologies, how will that be impacting the upcoming exams? You should be aware of that. Let's take a quick look at new developments. Recent articles, three of them, and I've covered uh, them on my YouTube channel. I'll just be giving you a list of the three, three of them shortly. But there are three new articles by the examining team, and I need to make you aware of that, particularly if you are a self-study student. Syllabus updates. There is a syllabus update in terms of change from quality control to quality management. Examining team has written the article, one of the article on syllabus change, which is from quality control to quality management. So when you look at three of them, one of them is here, quality control to quality management. I've already done a video on that. Current issues. This is uh, another one which uh, I picked up from the mock exam climate risk and the auditor responsibility. And I've already done a video on that. So you have to be alert of that. You have to be alert of the three new articles. You need to be alert of the terminology changing from quality control to quality management and how much impact will it have on your paper? How different is control from management? I've covered in that recent video. Professional marks, 20 of them, how they should be demonstrated. And day two, day three, day four will help you in that demonstration in a very good manner. Marking scheme, a slight adjustment, not a big one. Uh, everything remains the same. I think there's only a slight adjustment in the marking scheme for risk. Apart from that, everything remains the same. And I'll be covering that slight adjustment in the marking scheme for risk in day two tomorrow. Otherwise in that, the entire marking scheme structure is the same as it was for the June 22 exams in terms of the technical marks I'm talking about. And the last one, mock exam. There is, a new, there is a September 22 mock exam now available on the practice platform. Now, when you are preparing yourself for September exams, 14 days away, look at this in front of your screen. Ask a question to yourself. Three recent articles, have I covered them? How good I am on them? Have I watched the YouTube videos of my tutor on them? Uh, have, uh, do I know what is the change from quality control to quality management? Do I know what is the perspective behind quality management? Do I know the components of system of quality management I've covered in my YouTube session? Do you know about climate risk? Do you know what are the auditor responsibilities at the stage of planning and performing the audit in terms of a climatical risk coming in? 20 professional marks, how good you are on the 20 professional marks, how good you are at demonstrating them. You still have the next three days to be good on them. Marking schemes, are you aware of the slight adjustments in the marking schemes for audit risk and risk of material misstatement? Uh, the business risk remains the same in terms of the marking scheme. So the only adjustment is in the audit risk and risk of material misstatement, which will be covered on the day two tomorrow and mock exam. And I hope you've all done the mock exam by now, or you should be doing it in the last one week before exams. I prefer to be done in the last one week because I will be drilling the mock exams from tomorrow. So it would be better that you do it after it. Uh, or if you've done it before, then you can just self check yourself with what I do tomorrow. Is that clear with all of you with new developments? Recent articles, uh, the three of them, be assured you've covered them. Uh, these are on my YouTube channel, right? The article on assurance on social, environmental, and sustainability information, part one, is on my YouTube channel. You can see the link in red. Uh, this is for the syllabus area F, right? This is for syllabus area F. Other assignments. A question on a social. Uh, a question on this is high likely. A question <laughs> testing part one or part two is high likely. More important, a part two of the article is high likely. The part two of the same article, Assurance on so Social, Environmental and Sustainability Information, part two, uh, the article is being converted into a video format and is on my YouTube channel. Again, this is for the syllabus area F. And to me, this is high likely. This is just my uh, estimate. And you know, estimates are risky, just like the management estimates, right? Frequently asked question. 
Is there any change in the AAA syllabus for September 22 exams? And the answer to this question is yes, but just only one. The quality control changing to quality management. That is the only change in the syllabus. The quality control syllabus area C is changing to quality management. And that's where I've covered this article. The new article, this is the third article, right? Third article, International Standards on Quality Management, ISQM1. And this is the part one of the article, right? Part one of the article. And I've already done a discussion on that. And you can see the link on my YouTube channel. So this is the change of syllabus because you will not see the word quality control anymore. You will see the word quality management. So two articles hitting the syllabus area F, uh, one article hitting the syllabus area C, three new articles. Then already the practice exam available for September 22 on the practice platform, the term quality management is used instead of quality control. So if you practice the exams on the platform, which are applicable for September 22, right? Uh, if you practice these exams, if I can just show you that, I hope you can see the practice platform in front of your screen and you can see right over here the practice exams valid from September 22 onwards. So you click on them. There are three practice exams and one mock. I hope you can see that in front of your screen, right? Three practice exams, one mock exam. They've used the terminology quality management, not quality control. So if in any practice exam, there is a question on quality, the word quality management has been used instead of quality control. So please be assured that you are clear on that. Current issue. I've already covered the video on that on my YouTube channel. Current issue, the consideration of climatical related risk in the audit of financial statement. There is already an eight marks question in the mock exam for September 22 on how does the auditor plan and perform the audit when the auditor knows there are climatical risks facing your audit client? And I've already addressed that question. Please ensure you watch this video and you're updated of the current issue. So three new articles, two for syllabus area F, one for syllabus area C, one is the current issue. So that's four articles, three plus one. That's the development you should be aware of. Okay. The question on current issue, September 22 mock exam on practice platform. The question number one part D for eight marks is the question on current issue. I've already addressed this question in my session on the YouTube for current issue. Okay, now finally to big things. Time management and then a very big thing, professional marks and then the study planner. I hope you're ready for this a stretch of the webinar because this is extremely important. Now, just before proceeding further, uh, we are 45 minutes into the webinar. Uh, have, you got the, have you got things in control so far? Have you understood things so far? Uh, and are they really helping you uh, making a clear mindset ahead of your September 22 exams? Okay, that's really great. I hope it's giving you the confidence. I hope it's giving you the right mindset because you must be having a lot of confusions and issues and troubles and problems. I hope that's going down. That's great. Thank you so much, all of you. Okay. Uh, we'll take a break, but after time management, right? Uh, and we'll cover the two things after the break because I think you need to absorb as well. Now, listen to me for time management very, very carefully. Over the last few days, Lots of questions have come from students uh, asking me, can you give us some guidance on the time management for September 22 exams? And I was preparing for it uh, because I know I had to cover it in my webinar. So I really didn't respond to students. And most of the time I told the students, just wait for the upcoming webinar. Now, right here today, we are covering the time management. Now, listen to me carefully. There are 80 technical marks, right? And 20 professional marks. Professional marks will be achieved. Professional marks will be achieved as you work through the technical marks. 
So when you're writing the 80 technical marks, when you're writing the answer for 80 technical marks, you are achieving the professional marks. You're not doing anything extra for professional marks. You're not doing anything out of the way for 20 professional marks. You're not increasing the length of your answer for 20 professional marks. No, I'll, I'll be demonstrating that on the day two, day three, day four. But what you are doing is you are ensuring that when you're writing the answer for 80 technical marks, you are ensuring that the checklist of 20 professional marks is embedded in your answer. And I'll be giving you that checklist shortly. But the time management you need in the paper is for 80 technical marks. The 195 minutes you have in the exam paper is for 80 marks, not for 100 marks. Because when you're writing the 80 marks, at that point in time, you're demonstrating your professional skills. And for professional skills, you're not altering your answer. You're not making your answer different. You're not increasing the length of your answer. It's just within your answer. It's just within the, your answer. You just need to assure it's within your answer. So I think it's about assuring, assuring. It's about ensuring that the skills have gone in your answer. It's about assuring that they have embedded in your answer. And I'll be demonstrating that because I probably believe this uh, assuring and embedding and as you work through, uh, will not be understood till the time it's demonstrated. And there is plenty to be understood over the next three days, including the day to day. But the time management will be for 80 technical marks. And you will become more clear of that as we proceed further. Now, this is what I believe student number one. There are two students to me, and there are two different time managements to me. You need to conclude which student you are. Are you the student one or the two? Now, if you think you are a student one, pre-decided to go in the order of the paper, whatever the requirements are, you go to the exam hall and you are pre-decided that I will do the question number one first, then two, then three. You're pre-decided. Whatever is being asked in question number one, how difficult the question one is, how difficult the question one is. I will still do the question one first, then two, then three. I will not change the order. You're pre-decided. Now, if you're pre-decided, you have the 195 minutes in your hand and you have 80 marks to go with. You divide them and you get 2.44 minutes per mark. I've just rounded them off, right? It is 2.4375. So I've just rounded it off to 2.44 minutes per mark. Look at that. You used to have almost 100 marks in the previous paper. Uh, I'm not considering 96 and 4 because 4 professional marks in the previous paper was a very minor part. So we, we were not taking the professional marks separately in the previous paper because that was just a minor chunk. So we used to say previously 195 divided by 100 because 4 was a very minor part. So we used not to consider 4. 195 divided by 100. So we used to have 1.95 minutes per mark previously. Now you have 2.44 minutes per mark. Previously, you used to have 1.95. You have incremental time. You have 50, you have 50 seconds more. You have, you have half a minute more, sorry. You had 2.45 minutes. Now you have half a more minute. Why? Why more time? Because you need to embed, you need to demonstrate, you need to improve the quality of your answer. Now for every technical mark you are writing, how much time you have? 2.44 minutes versus 1.95 minutes previously. So is the examining team giving you an extra time per mark? Why? Because they want to ensure that when you're writing one technical mark, that is embedded with a high quality, that is, that is embedded with your professional skills, and that's where you are demonstrating uh, your professionalism right across the 80 marks paper. So extra time. Now, as per 2.44, I divided the 40 marks with 2.4, I got 99 minutes. It's approximately 97.6 if you work on the calculator, 
but I've taken 97.6 as 99 minutes here, uh, just to keep my equation better. So I've kept 99 minutes for the question number one instead of 97.6 if you work on the calculator. And for 99 minutes in the first question, one fourth of the time is to be spent on reading and planning. And that's my rule since last many webinars. If you've watched my previous webinar, I always give this rule. One fourth of the time is reading and planning because without reading and planning, you cannot write. And if you're writing something without reading and planning, that's the worst answer you're writing. So one fourth of the 99 minutes, which is 24.75. So I've just taken 24. So 24 minutes is to be spent on reading and planning. The question number one exhibits requirements, everything. And after 24 minutes, you have 75 minutes to write the answer. Same goes with question two and three. In question number two, 20 multiplied by 2.4, 48 minutes. I've taken that instead of 48.8. 12 minutes to read and plan and 36 minutes to write. And sorry, in the last one, uh, just a mistake typing one, it should be 36 here, 36 in the last one. It should be 36 minutes to write question number three. So the same answer for two gets to three, sorry. 36 minutes, right? Just make that correction. Now, this is the time management if you are a student number one. How many of you are student number one? How many of you have pre-decided that we'll start with one, two, and three? And how many of you will, will follow this time management? 195 divided by 80. How many of you will do this? Okay. Okay, good, good. So there are a couple of students, couple of students, not couple, now increasing, which are going with 195 divided by 80. So do you understand the incremental time? Do you understand 1.95 minutes versus 2.44 minutes? And do you understand why the examining team is giving you an extra time per mark? I will just be writing this on the word file. Do you believe why the examining team is giving you extra mark per mark? Yes. For to, for to improve the quality. And how would you improve the quality? Day two, day three, day four will be an eye-opener. Will be an eye-opener for all of you. Okay, if you are a student number two then, a slight change to a student two. If you're a student two and we know examining team gives you a permission, you can do paper in any order. Not necessarily you go with paper in one, two, three. You can do two, one, three. You can do two, three, one, whatever. The examining team is very happy with that even. If you are a student who says, I'll go to the exam and I'll open the question and I'll see the requirement of the question number one. What is in the partner email? What is the partner asking me in the email? A, B, C, D. Okay, I'll open the question number two and I'll see what is the examiner asking in the question number two, A, B, C, for example. And I'll see the question number three, what is the examiner asking in ABC? And this will, might take me like 10 minutes approximately. One, two, three. And within those 10 minutes, I'll decide which question should I do first? Should I do three first? Should I do two first? Should I do one first? And I'll decide the order of my paper. I'll, I'll start with the strongest question first. Student number two. Now 10 minutes gone and you've taken a decision. You've taken a decision two, three, one, or you've taken a decision one, two, three, or you've taken a decision three, two, one, whatever, or you've taken a decision one, three, two. Now that's taken 10 minutes. You've read the requirements. You know the requirements. The requirements are absorbed in your mind, but 10 minutes have gone. Now that means you have 185 minutes now with 80 marks because 10 minutes have been gone. Now, you have 2.31 minutes per mark still versus 1.95 minutes you had before. Do you still have an incremental time? 1.95 versus 2.31, even after spending 10 minutes. So 2.31 minutes, 40 marks multiplied by 2.31, you have total 93 minutes. Uh, one fourth of that, ideally 20 minutes on the reading and planning, I've just adjusted some times, right? If you work on the calculator, you find a bit different answers. 20 minutes of reading and planning because you already put 
some time on reading the requirements. You already know the requirements of the question number one. So that will just reduce the time on reading and planning. 20 minutes for reading and planning the first question and 73 minutes to write. 46 minutes for the second question, 20 multiplied by 2.31, 10 minutes of reading and planning, 36 minutes of writing, and same goes with the third question, 10 minutes of reading and 36 minutes of writing. Now, how many of you would like to go with the student two option? Anyone who wants to decide which question to start first? Because starting with the strongest question first is also a very good approach. Okay, okay, that's two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there are good number of students, right? Just saying we will, because see, this is also a good approach, but tell me, tell me one thing, student one or student two, do you have incremental time to write, write your one mark? 1.95 versus 2.44 or 1.95 versus 2.31. In both the equations, do you have an incremental time per mark? Tell me, yes or no? Do you have incremental time per mark? Yes. So what will you do in that incremental time? That's the big question. That's what you need to understand right after the break. Let me write it down on the word file because that's what the answer is right after the break. Look at this carefully on the word file. Time management. That's what we were covering, right? Uh, just let me phrase this for you. And I'll be looking for your answers right after the break. Time management. Whether you are a student one or two in terms of time, in terms of time management, you have incremental time per technical mark in September 22 exams over the June 22 exams, how, what does this incremental time, uh, what does this incremental time expect from you or what you should do in this incremental time? Do you believe examiner expectation will rise with the quality of your answer because examining team is giving you the incremental time? Do you believe this? Examining, sorry, the marking team or the assessor expectation around the quality of answer will rise considering student now have incremental time to write one mark answer, to write one mark answer. Now, if you compare the first situation, the student one situation, we had 2.44 minutes versus 1.95 minutes we used to have in the June exams. Because in the June exams, I used to give this time management. Now in the September exams, I'm giving the time management of what? 2.44. Can anyone find the percentage increase? Can you minus uh, 2.44 minus 1.95? And can you divide that by 1.95? Tell me how much is the percentage rise in the incremental time? Can anyone find that answer? How much is the percentage rise? 25.12. Is that the right percentage, uh, Rahul? Uh, can anyone else confirm? Thank you so much, Rahul, for confirming. Can anyone else confirm 25.12%? Okay, that's good. So there is a surge of 25.1, 25% rise in time you have per one mark. So what is the examining team looking for this 25% rise? If your answer quality is not changing, the examining team will not be happy. If your answer quality is not changing from June to September, examining team is not happy at all. And if you go with the student number two, uh, we had 2.31 minutes, right? In September 22 uh, versus 
1.95 minutes we had in June 22. What is the incremental rise? Uh, can you give me the percentage, Rahul, again? In the situation number two, what's the percentage? 2.31, 18.46. Thank you. So you were very quick on calculators, Rahul. That will help you in your exam papers. 18.46, 18% rise. 18% rise in time you have per one mark. Right? So do you believe with this rise in time you have per mark that's also increasing the expectation? Expectation around the quality of answer will rise. Do you agree? So I will be demonstrating that day two, day three, day four. I will be demonstrating it today even when I look at the checklist of professional marks. And I will be giving you so good examples of what the incremental time demands from you. So my big, big question to all of you, what the incremental time demands, what the incremental time demands from a student. We'll be looking for this answer right after a break coming shortly. Is everyone clear with the time management? Because right after the break, We'll be looking at the critical exam techniques and we'll be looking at the answers, what the incremental time demands from you. We'll be looking at a checklist of professional marks because if you're not improving the threshold of your quality of your answer, you're failing the AAA paper. Not exactly the reduction in the length of the case study, Akib. The case study length will still remain the same uh, because uh, even if you look at... Uh, the previous case studies, and now you look at the recent case studies, the length is still the same, right? Uh, that, that has nothing to do with the length of the case study. Okay, just one last thing and giving you the break. Uh, on my Word file, what this incremental time demands from a student? Improving the quality threshold of your answer. That is what is demanded. And I'll be covering what this improving the quality threshold means and you will be amazed right after the break. Okay, so one hour into the webinar, all of you, have you got something out of it? Because we still have another, uh, more than an hour after the break remaining because professional marks and study planners will come in. Uh, that will take time as well. So uh, how, how has been the first one hour in terms of gaining confidence or motivations or the right fine tuning ahead of the September 22 exams. Your feedback is important. If you can just drop that in a minute and we are going off break. How was the first one hour? H has it benefited you? Has it given you some uh, right clarities, guidance, suggestions? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Darshan, Mohsin. Uh, thank you so much for that feedback, Hanan. Thank you so much, Varshani. Thank you so much, Joseph, Diana, Rahul. Thank you so much, Akib. Thank you so much. Okay, now it's time for a break. Not a very big one. I don't just want the momentum to be broke, broken down. Uh, it's like 8.04 in Pakistan, 8.04 p.m. So let's resume at 8.15, right? 8.15 p.m. Pakistan Standard Time. So just a 10 minutes break, right? Is, has everyone heard that? So please be back at 8.15 p.m. Pakistan time, 10 minutes. Have a cup of tea with you and come back. Break till 8.15 p.m. for 10 minutes. I hope you got this message in the chat box, right? I'm just muting myself and putting my camera off and I'll be back live exactly at 8.15 for the last part of the day one.
Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you're all back from the break. Please confirm that and please also confirm that you can hear me. We are starting the second and the last part for the first day uh, right after the break. Okay, that's great. If you're all back from the break, that's great enough. Uh, okay, let's start the proceeding. Uh, we were discussing the incremental time and how that incremental time should impact the quality of your answer. And because there is an incremental time, so when the marker or the assessor is checking your paper, uh, that expectation will rise as well. Their, their expectation will rise as well. Uh, they will be looking for a better answer, a good answer, and uh, they will be more critical uh, when they're rewarding marks to you, knowing the fact that you had an extra time to write one mark, and that should reflect in a better quality answer from September 22 exams onwards. So just uh, discussing that quality uplift of your answer, uh, I will be giving you lots of suggestions in the next 30 minutes, including the professional marks, and that would be beneficial for all of you. And every day starting from tomorrow, day two, day three, day four, will give you more uh, ideas, suggestions for the quality uplift of your answer, and that will really be beneficial for you to make to meet the expectation of your marking marker or assessor. Now, first of all, the critical exam techniques. Number one, students should not overrun time on any one question. That's very critical. Uh, I believe that with the time management you have in the paper. Now, if question number one has 99 minutes, for example, whichever student you are, it's just in thought process, are 99 minutes for the first question, or you have like 48 minutes for the second question. You should not overrun that time. Whatever best you can do in that 99 minutes or 48 minutes, do that. And wherever the time is end, stop and get to the question number two. And then three, don't even overrun the time by five minutes on one question. If you are left with something, ignore it, leave it blank and move on. And this is the practice which should be done right across the 100 marks paper. Now, if you just keep overrunning time for one question, instead of 99 minutes, you take 110 minutes. You say, what's, what's the problem? I just took 11 more minutes. But that 11 more minutes have spoiled the time management for the question two and three. And you will come in a time pressure where you might impair the quality of your last question you are doing in the exam paper. And that's mostly what happens. The student impair the quality of the last question they are attempting uh, in the exam context. Please ensure every question contributes to your success, not one, not two, not three. So you have to give every question a chance. You have to give every question the best in the time you have and move on. Because in every question, you have opportunities to score. In every question, you have opportunities to score, not just in one of them. So I hope you follow this, all of you. You will stop, even you are left with five marks, even you are left with seven marks. Ignore it, move on to the second question. You have to do the best within the time, whatever you can do, and move on. Because if you, uh, if, if you go over the three questions in the time you had, at least you have created opportunities for you to pass. But if you just try to excel one question and ignore one question in the exam hall, leave one question unattended in exam hall, that is the worst. If any student leave one question unattended, full one question unattended, that is the worst you can do with a triple A paper. Is everyone clear with this? Is everyone clear with the first bullet? I'm just waiting for your answers. Great, thank you. Second, read the question requirement carefully. And I'll be showing you that on the day two, day three, day four, because me as a tutor, 
even if you have taken my full course and my previous webinars, you do see that I emphasize a lot on reading and breaking the question, reading the comma, reading the and in the question, because that really matters. If you're just reading a requirement in a hurry and you're overlooking the comma and the and, you're spoiling your marks gaining ability. And I hope you all agree with me that even in my regular course and even in my webinars, I've been very focused on reading the requirements and very focused on guiding you about how to read the requirement. I, I, I hope you are clear with that. And I hope you do spend time on reading requirements very carefully in, 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 your, in your practice at home and in your real exams. Third, plan your answer. One fourth of the time has to be spent on reading and planning. And for every question, I've allocated the time. For every question, I have shown you how much reading and planning time you have. And I'll show you the importance of that tomorrow, day two, day three and day four, that when I'm reading the first question, second and third, what is the significance of one fourth of the time? What is the value of the one fourth of the time? If you really want to improve the quality threshold of your answer, if you really want to impress your marker, if you really want to impress your assessor, that one fourth time you have invested on reading and planning will matter. Remember, you are all accountants, right? You look at cost benefit analysis. That's, that's, a, that's how you look at things. Look at the cost benefit analysis of the one fourth time you're putting in. The one fourth time you are deducting from your total exam time. Look at the benefits you're getting. You are improving the quality threshold of your answer. You are impressing the assessor and you're getting passed in the AAA paper. A lot of time I've seen students rel reluctant to read. They just want to write and write and write without even looking at what's happening in the case study without even looking at the facts in the case study, without even uh, trying to identify or uh, try to identify the problems and issues in the case study. They just want to put everything they know about the topic. So do you understand the investment in planning your answer is critical? Do you understand how critical is the investment in, in planning the answer one fourth of the time? So you're all accountants, right? So is this investment worthy? Is the return on investment good? Is the return on investment good? Yes, definitely yes. It's not a bad bargain, right? It's not a bad bargain. Fourth, pay particular attention to the verbs. How many times in an exam question you see examiner asking you evaluate, assess. Now, if the examiner is asking you to evaluate and assess something, you need to give conclusions, right? How many times the examiner asks you comment on uh, comment on the matters you should consider in deciding whether to accept XYZ company as a new client, whether to accept. Now that whether means a conclusion. Examiner is asking you whether to accept. So at the end of the answer, you will tell examiner whether you are accepting or not. There are so many requirements which needs a conclusion. If the examiner says recommend, you can put things in, <coughs> sorry, you can put things in bullets. If the examiner says, recommend something, you can put things in bullets. We know that there, there are things like actions. There are things like procedures. There are things like evidence, which can be put in bullets. Rest of the paper has to be done in a paragraph form. But yes, procedures can be put in one, two, three, four. Actions can be put in one, two, three, four. Evidence can be put in one, two, three, four. Rest is all paragraphs. Conclusions were needed. Conclusions where necessary should be given. This, this is all what, what will eventually impact uh, your quality of answer before we come to the professional marks. Next, pay attention to sign post. And I'll be showing you that in the next three days. Pay attention to the sign post. Warning signs. Pay attention to the sign post. Sign post, right? How many times, how many times examiner tells you in a question, do not do this, don't do this, avoid this. How many times the examiner tells you, 
that you should not do this. Not, not. I'm not looking. Not, not. How many times have you seen this in past papers? Examiner telling you, you should not do this. Signpost, right? And if you're still doing it, now you have a communication skill. Now you have a communication skills to be demonstrated in the first question. And in the first question, if the examiner is giving you a signpost that you should not consider the risk arising from uh, risk arising from the deferred tax consequences of a share-based payment, like in the mock exam, I think. The examiner mentioned in the risk question, you need not to consider the risk of the deferred tax consequences of the share-based payment. The examiner is saying you should not, and you still identify the deferred tax consequences as a risk of the share-based payment. You are not impressing the marker, and you are losing your communication marks, because if the examiner is saying you should not do this, you should not do this. If the examiner is saying you should do this, you should do this. I hope you're getting this. Signpost. Is everyone clear what signposts are? When I do the question one tomorrow, I'll show you the signpost. How many times the examiner says you should? How many times the examiner says you should not? Will you be critical of that in the upcoming exams? Will that, will that affect the quality of the answer? Will that impact losing the communication marks, all of you? So will you pay particular attentions to the signpost? Are you all, you, are you all clear on that? Please uh, tell me. We can move on. Okay, great. And do you really focus on that uh, when you're practicing at home? Do you really focus on that? Great. And I, I think I've been very critical of that in my, in my course as well, guiding you that you should read the requirements carefully with the signpost, the don'ts, because the don'ts needs to be avoided, right? Okay, moving on. If you get stuck, this is very important, right? If you get stuck with a question, leave it and return. Suppose you're doing the question number one, A, B, C, D. You did A, you did B, you did C, right? And by the C, you have put 75 minutes out of the 99 minutes. And you come to the D part and you're blank. You, you come across climate risk and you say, what a climate risk is? I've never read about it. I don't even know about what a climate risk is. How can I do this part? Rather than wasting your time, you still have 14 minutes here for D part. For example, stop, get to the question number two, start the question number two, A, B, C. Do the question number three, A, B, C and keep 14 minutes or 10 minutes in the end. Come back, come back to this D part. And in, in, in the 10 minutes, do whatever you can do. At least write something. Are you getting this? Is everyone clear with the bullet number six? So if you get stuck, leave and come back. How many times you do it in, in, in the practice at home? When you're doing a real, real practice at home on the practice platform, how many, how many times you do this approach? You leave and come back. So if you have time for the D requirement, but you don't know the answer for the D requirement, will you waste your time sitting for 14 minutes and thinking what to do, what to do, what to do, what to do? No. Rather than move on, come back with 10 minutes or 14 minutes remaining in the end. Right? So is, is that a good approach? The bullet number six? Do all of you like this approach in the bullet six as a critical exam technique? Okay, that's great. Moving on. Do everything you can to make the life easier of the marker. That's interesting. Now, what is that? You need to present the answer with a structured approach, headings, subheadings. If you are developing a point, for example, you are writing an audit risk. Now you wrote one audit risk for like four and five sentences. And you want to write further audit risk. There are, at times there are situations, it's an exam where one situation is giving multiple risk. Now you wrote one risk of like three to four sentences, then change the paragraph and start the next risk and then change the paragraph. Wherever you want to start something new or you want to discuss something new, 
start from a new paragraph and it is beneficial to give a heading if you can give heading that would be great headings subheadings change of paragraph where you are changing a point a lot of time the students just write in one paragraph from the start to the end and they say oh this is the i've seen assignments of students because i've been checking your assignments for the last two months three months now and some of the students i open the assignment and i simply say wow such a beautiful assignment in terms of structure and sometimes i open the assignment and say oh where is the next point where is the where is the point where is the next point i i need to read within i need to read within the paragraph to find okay this is where the next point is starting wherever you are writing you want to write six points or seven points make them in different paragraphs change the paragraph start a paragraph from a new line or use headings and subheadings just like you do in the audit risk answer or a business risk answer that sets a good approach so if the examiner ask you explain the matters you can give headings of each matter from a case study make the answer better so presentation structure headings subheadings change of paragraph this all makes the life easier of the marker and I, i can i can be i can better tell you this because when i am reading your assignments some assignments are so easy to check and so easy to understand and so easy to mark and there are few assignments which are so difficult that i need to spend like 10 15 minutes just to understand read and respond so is that point clear to all of you do everything you can to make the life easier of the marker because it's a theoretical paper it's not a numerical paper where a bad presentation can count as well right that's important moving next avoid list and bullets unless requested i just made that clear right you can use the bullets and uh, list in procedures actions uh, in like evidence these are areas more common where bullets are used unless not you can not write the whole paper in bullets and list because that's not recommendable right additional information right that's good rajeshwari uh, even one student asked me i think rahul asked me about uh, the inquiries sometimes the examiner says specific inquiries in a due diligence question so specific inquiries are like procedures right you can write them in bullets so know the areas know the areas which can be written in bullets is that clear to all of you otherwise avoid structure question number 1 in a briefing note format that's very important because that's now a part of the communication skill and you have four marks for briefing note i will be making that clear when when we move to the day 2 tomorrow because we'll be looking at the question number 1 very focused but Uh, i hope if you have watched my videos on professional skills primarily if you have watched my video on the communication skill i was very clear on that briefing note for four marks right so these are critical exam techniques take a print out of this once you get this presentation uh, with you uh, over the whatsapp groups and over the youtube channel please ensure you follow them these critical exam techniques which are in total i think 10 if i'm not wrong yes 10 please to follow them is that clear so you have an incremental time uh marker expectation will rise assessor expectation will rise and you need to deliver better you need to impress and how would you impress we are still into that journey let's start the definition of impress Now let's come to the big part of the webinar today and the second last part of the webinar today professional marks 20 of them and that's where the uplifting of your answer has to come that's where the incremental time per technical marks you have because the incremental time you have to write the technical mark you need to demonstrate the professional skills you need to improve the quality threshold of your answer and i'll be demonstrating that tomorrow and over the next 3 days let's look at the list and let's take some examples now we know there are four professional skills right communication you will find in the first question 
Beside communication, the three others, which you will find in all the three questions, is analysis and skepticism, evaluation and judgment, and commercial acumen. And these are the three skills you will find in every question of the AAA paper. Let's take a list. Uh, let's take a look at the checklist, which will uplift the quality of your answer, which will help you meet the expectation of your marker, and which will help you with what you need to do more in the incremental time you have in the September 22 exams. Let's get to this. And I'll be showing you the application of this on the day two, day three, and day four. There are already videos on professional marks, just for guidance, if you have forgotten that on my YouTube channel, you can watch the videos on the professional marks right at this link here. How to boost them, how to boost the professional marks. What is the best strategy to get most of the 20 professional marks? You need to uplift your answer quality threshold. And that's what we are discussing now and over the next three days. But how would you do it? How would you improve the quality threshold of your answer? That's the big question. And you need an answer for that. And that answer will come over the next few hours. Second, it's pretty simple. If you want to improve the quality threshold of your answer, if you ensure and reinforce the following checklist, which I'm giving you. Now, the checklist to come, if you do that, you stick to that, you implement that, you are having a fair chance of improving the quality threshold and doing justice with the incremental time you have in exam paper. Let's look at the checklist. Boosting professional marks checklist. Let's go in order and let's discuss where we need discussion because some things will be pending for day two, day three, and day four. So if I think something is on the day two, day three, and day four, I'll just put it pending. Number one, putting the question number one in the format of a briefing note. Briefing note is equal to the format plus the logical flow of the answer, which I will be demonstrating tomorrow. Logical flow of the answer means A, B, C, D, not D, C, B, A. In introduction of the briefing note, headings of the briefing note, subheadings of the briefing note, and putting a conclusion. Up to four marks for communication skills are available in the question one only. Now, how difficult is that? If you structure the community, if you structure the briefing note well with what is given in the bracket, and if you put the briefing note well, you are gaining up to four marks here just by ensuring the format, the logical flow, the introduction, the conclusion, the headings, and the subheadings. So you can gain up to three marks, not four. You can gain three out of four. Because one mark will be for how cleared you communicated. What was the clarity of your communication uh, when you were writing the answer? Is, the, is that difficult? Is that difficult? Not at all. Calculating and commenting on materiality where possible. Now listen to me this, uh, at this very carefully. Though I will be covering this tomorrow as well. Where possible. Now a lot of time the students uh, must have attended my previous webinars or my regular classes. And they know there is a cap of materiality. You know there are like two to three marks in the first question for materiality, right? Am I right? Please confirm me. There is a cap on materiality, like two marks or three marks maximum, uh, which you can get for materiality, right? Please confirm that, correct? Thank you so much, Darshan, for confirming. Now, with the professional marks coming in, uh, with examiner liking you to comment and calculate materiality where possible. Now, if the examiner says in the marking scheme for technical marks that two marks are available for commenting and calculating on materiality in the question number one, for example, or three, we'll look at the marking scheme tomorrow. And a student says, okay, I'll just calculate three materialities and that is it because marks are maximum marks for materiality are three. I'll, I'll not calculate fourth, fifth, sixth. No. Now you have professional marks. And now I want my students 
to calculate materiality where it is possible across the 100 marks paper, where it is possible. Whether you want to calculate it five times, six times, seven times, eight times, nine times, 10 times across the 100 marks paper. And in the first question, the risk question, even though the technical marks for materiality are capped at three or two maximum, but wherever in the risk question you need to comment on the materiality, you will do it. You will not look at the two marks and three marks because you're also getting the materiality marks under the professional skill marks as well. I hope I covered that in my videos on the professional skill marks. Is that clear to all of you? So wherever possible, will you calculate materialities in, in your paper this time? Or you will just be concerned with the capping of marks? Will you, will you be doing that, all of you? And will you just be calculating or you will also be commenting whether it is material or not? You will also be commenting, right? So it's the C plus C, C plus C. If you just do one C, you're not getting the professional marks, right? You have to do both the C's, right? Both the C's to get the professional marks. Calculate and comment. So if one student says, no, uh, there are two marks for materiality. I just calculate two. No, that's very bad. That's a very, that's a very bad approach. Because you might be taking the two technical marks, but because you didn't calculate it materiality where possible, you are losing your professional marks. So are you clear with materiality, technical and professional marks now? All of you? Okay, great. Thank you. Moving on. Calculating ratios, trends, calculations where possible and commenting on them as to why they prove, as to what they prove, sorry, and justifying your point. Now, wherever you have a financial data in the question number one or two or three, and you believe from the financial data, you can identify what is rising or what is falling, or you can identify a ratio, and you can link that ratio or a calculation or a trend in your answer. And you can prove in your answer that what this calculation means or what this ratio means or what this trend means that is a greater demonstration of your professionalism in the paper. For example, in a question on a going concern, uh, a ratio calculated can be demonstrated as a matter which brings doubt on the going concern of a company. Agree? Uh, a ratio calculated in an audit risk question can demonstrate a risk of material misstatement. I, I hope you're getting my point. So you need to find that. You need to find that. Uh, trends, what is rising, what is falling. Risings and fallings help us in the paper, right? The risings and fallings even help us in the question on PFI. Because in a review of PFI, we have a lot of financial data, the fo forecasted data. And we normally find the rise and falls in the forecasted data. So I think that rising and falling part is a very uh, regular feature of the AAA paper. Are you all clear with the bullet number three? Are you all uh, getting that point of calculating the ratios and trends wherever possible? <clears throat> So it's, it's not just about the calculation again. It's calculation and justifying, J. Calculation and justifying, J. And then you get it. So again, when I do the one, two, and three tomorrow and day after tomorrow in the webinar, I'll be doing it. I'll be showing you that how clever you need to be. Wherever possible, do it. I'll, I'll be showing you the opportunities, the opportunities tomorrow. I'll be showing you the way you can grab the professional marks so easily in your paper. So is, is the bullet tree clear to all of you? Just waiting for your answers before we proceed to the fourth one on this particular slide. <clears throat> right? So will, will you do it? Yes, it's, it's, it's the calculation and the commenting, right? The commenting means the justification, right? The commenting means the justification, Rahul. The commenting and justification is the same thing, right? So is everyone clear? Next, fourth, prioritize significant risk. 
I've already mentioned that prioritization of significant risk in my videos on the professional skill marks. There's already a YouTube session I did on what significant risks are, how you pick up the significant risk from the question. And you will be amazed at the technique I will be guiding you about significant risk tomorrow when I do the question number one of the mock exam on the significant audit risk. So you will get another dimension of picking up the significant risk. So when you're writing the answer, significant audit risk answer, at least the first two or first three of them has to be significant. But thereafter, you can write it in any order. But if you start with the least important risk first, the least significant risk first, you are not impressing the assessor. <clears throat> You're not improving the threshold of your answer. So if the examiner is saying significant risk and you're starting with illogical risk, unimportant risk, uh, hypothetical risk first, you're not impressing. But if the exam, <clears throat> sorry, if the examiner wants you to write the significant risk and at least the first two or first three are significant, thereafter they're not, you have done the justice. You have done the justice. Can you prioritize, suppose you're writing seven risk in the answer. Can you prioritize all of them in the order? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's next to impossible. It's even next to impossible for me. It's next to impossible for the examiner to prioritize them in the order of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But at least the first one, sorry, the first two, the first three can be done in that order. So what are we getting out of this? The, the briefing notes, the, the materialities, the trends, the calculations, the ratios, significant, putting the risk in the significance, in the form of significance, that's four, right? In the checklist, right? Moving on. I've given the boxes, right? You can take them. If you're doing this in your answers at home, take a printout. When you're doing an answer, just keep taking that. Have I done this? Have I done this? Have I done this? Can you just take a printout of this and evaluate your answers? That is it all going in your answers? Can this give you a better assurance that your answer fits the definition of a professional marks? So will, will this checklist help you, all of you? The first four, can you take a printout and self, uh, and can you compare your answer with? Right? Okay, next. Next, number fifth, explain the implication of an ethical threat. Wherever you are writing an ethical threat in the paper, suppose you say this is a self-interest threat, or you say this is a self-review threat, or you say this is a familiarity threat, you need to justify why. If you are putting the why, you are impressing the assessor for professional marks as well. So if you say it is a self-interest, then why it is a self-interest in the context of the case? If it is a familiarity, you need to justify. Have I covered this why in my block two? Have I covered this why in my regular course? Have I explained to you this why is in my regular course? So you need to write the why, right? You need to write the justifications. Next, recommending actions and procedures which are in context of case. Look at this yellow which are reasonable. If you are writing a procedure, which is from within the case study, if you're writing an action, which is in the case study, with, which, which, which is connected with the case study, sorry, that is impressing. And anything impressing is contributing towards your professional marks. So you're writing a procedure that is technical, right? But if that procedure is blended with a case study, that procedure is linked with a case study. That procedure is extracted from the context of the case study. It's not just giving you a technical mark, but it's also giving you a professional mark. Yes, suppose a question is not asking for action. For example, there's a question on comment on the ethical and professional issues. Follow stop Rahul and others. If a question is saying comment on the ethical and professional issues, question mark. Is, is there anywhere examiner asking for actions here? No. Examiner is simply saying comment on the ethical and professional issues. Full stop. But if you write an action, that is good. If you still write an action, that is wonderful. So even if an ethical and professional issue or a quality management issue 
is not asking for an action and you still write action, that is good. That is not bad, right? Is that clear to all of you? Rahul, I hope you're clear on that as well, right? Okay, great. So my concern was that you are writing an action or you're writing a procedure, but if, it, if that is in context of case, that's wonderful, right? Yes, uh, Naya, when you're writing a action or you're writing a safeguard, that has to be in the context of the case, right? That that uh, most of the time we know when we're writing an ethical safeguard, that's more like a bookish safeguard. That's fine. We say change the partner or we say don't accept uh, the gifts and hospitality, something like that. But again, that's in the context of the case. At least if, if, when you say discuss with management, we can, we can say discuss with alpha company management or we can say discuss with the Rick, Rick group management or discuss with the Eagle group management. At least if you try bringing the jargons of the question in our answers, that also make it relevant to the case study. So a lot of times students say, discuss with management. And if one student says, discuss with the Eagle group management, who is getting the professional marks? The first student or the second student? Discuss with management is a right procedure, is a technical procedure. But discuss with the Eagle group management is not just the technical, it's not just the technical, it's also professional. I hope you're getting it. So try making your procedures in context of the case. Next, number seventh. Case specific answer. Link your answer with case as much as possible. This is the golden rule of the AAA paper. Not even when, not when the professional marks were available. I used to tell students, write a case-specific answer. Because the more case-specific answer you're writing, you are gaining most of your professional marks. If you're if you are tailoring your answer, if you're adapting your answer, if you are synchronizing your answer into the case, and the case is blended, the case is transformed into your answer, the case is embedded in your answer, this is so, so important. Embed the answer. Uh, embed the case in your answer, integrate the case in your answer, sync the case in your answer, absorb the case in your answer. Look at these words, absorb, embed, integrate, sync. If you're doing that as much as possible, you're gaining professional marks. Is everyone clear with this sync, integration, embedding, absorbing, adapting? These are golden words to get most of the professional marks in AAA. So if any student is adapting, Absorbing, integrating, syncing, embedding, you are gaining your marks. Is everyone clear with the point number seven? Point eight, provide conclusions where necessary. Wherever the examiner asks you, evaluate. Where the examiner asks you, assess. Where the examiner asks you, comment on the matters, whether to accept the new client, whether to accept. Whether means conclusion. So please ensure you're writing the conclusions where necessary. Is that clear? Last, ninth, investigate management statements carefully. Be skeptical. Challenge these statements of management. Challenge the opinions of the management. Challenge uh, the basis of management. That is extremely important. Now, I believe... Uh, the management, if you have done the mock exam, the September 22 mock exam, I think uh, in the September 22 mock exam, the question number one, there was a situation uh, where the company was selling some properties and that had an option to repurchase and the company was retaining controls over the property. So it was primarily a sale and lease back transaction. It was primarily a financing transaction and the company had recognized uh, the profit on disposal uh, on the sale of property as uh, other income. And you need to challenge that statement of management. You need to tell management that how can you recognize a profit on disposal of 145 million in other income when this is a sale and lease back transaction, when this is a financing transaction, this is not a genuine sale. So you have wrongly recognized the other income. I hope if you have done the September 
2022 mock exam, you must have come across that situation, sale of eight properties, which was basically a sale and lease back transaction where you need to recognize the asset and depreciate the asset, not to recognize the other income. Are you clear with that? How many of you have done this situation in the mock exam so far? Not yet done, okay. Anyone who has done it and understood the situation? But that, that's like where you're challenging management, right? If the management is not recognizing a provision, challenging them, why are you not recognizing? Or if the management has recognized a provision where it should not be recognized, challenging the management, uh, justifying the management, where the management has not adjusted uh, a, a, an adjusting event after the balance sheet date, where the management has not given a disclosure of a non-adjusting event, ask them to do it, justify, be skeptical. Not every management statement will be right. Not every management opinion will be right because the management is involved in fraudulent activities. You need to question them. You need to justify them. You need to be skeptical. Is that clear to all of you? How many of you have done the mock exam? And have you come across that situation of the eight properties I was just discussing? Fourteen days away. None of you have done the mock exams yet. Okay, so lots of lots of uh, lots of you are saying you will still be doing it. Okay, that's great. But I I hope you understand my situation of sale and lease back. Right, that it was a sale and lease back transaction. And the management recognized the other income uh, profit on disposal, which was technically a wrong accounting treatment because it was not a genuine sales transaction. It was just a financing arrangement. And in a financing arrangement, uh, when you retain the ownership on the asset, you cannot recognize the profit on disposal, right? I hope you know that accounting treatment from IFRS 16 and IFRS 15. Okay, moving next. We got to ninth situation. Few of the last ones. Challenge why the evidence gathered by the audit team is insufficient. How many times you get a question, comment on the sufficiency and appropriateness of the evidence, and you are a manager, and you are commenting whether the evidence gathered by the audit team is sufficient uh, or not, or appropriate or not. And when you're commenting on that, you need to challenge, you need to justify why. If you say, if the, manage, if the audit team has just obtained a verbal confirmation from the lawyer, about an ongoing case, you will, you will need to justify that why a verbal correspondence or a verbal confirmation from a lawyer is an inappropriate evidence. You cannot just say, uh, because the audit team corresponded with the lawyer verbally, this is, in, this is inappropriate for a stop. You might get a technical mark, but you're not getting a professional mark. Till the time you justify that verbal communications is an inappropriate source of evidence because there is no evidence supporting the verbal stance. And anyone giving you a verbal communication can take a U-turn later, can deny, can deny the statement later. So when, when you ask something verbally, there is no documentary evidence of that. You need to justify your statement to get marks. So if you just say uh, the verbal communication is inappropriate for a stop, you might get half a mark technical. But you need to justify why a verbal communication is inappropriate to get the professional marks. Are you getting this? Number 10th, all of you. Number 11th, explaining clear impact of a business risk on the business objectives, present or future. If there is a problem, if there is a business risk, what is the impact of a business risk? Is, is the impact on the profitability? Is the impact on the market share? Is the impact on the revenue? Is the impact on the reputation? Is the impact on employee employees' dissatisfaction? Is the Im impact on your future sustainability going concern? You need to find the right impact of a business risk. But lots of times I've seen students that for every business risk they're writing, they're writing four business risk. For every business risk they will, they will write, thus the company will not be a going concern. The company will not be a going concern. How many times can you repeat the same statement again and again in uh, when you're writing four business risk? Every business risk 
should have a unique impact which should not overlap with the impact you have written above. So if there are four business risks you're writing, because I believe you don't get to write more than four business risks in exams. If you're writing four business risks, each one of them has four different impacts. So if for one you wrote profitability, you can write reputation for the second one. You can write going concern for the third one. You can write the liquidity. But you cannot just repeat the same again and again because that will not impress. And if you're not impressing, you're not gaining professional marks. Remember, impress is equal to professional marks. If your answer is not impressive, you're getting the technical marks. You're getting half of one technical marks. But if because it's not impressive, you are losing that 20 chunk of marks. And without those 20 chunk of marks, if you expect to pass the paper, never. If you're gaining zero out of 20, don't expect to get 50 out of 80. If any one of you is in that hypothetical illusion, please come out of it. 50 out of 80, zero out of 20, and still pass the paper, never, never, never. This will never going to happen. Till the time you take some professional marks, that's essential. So impress is the key. Number 12, exercise careful decisions, whether to accept a client or not. When you are evaluating or you are commenting on the matters, whether to accept a client, be critical, give a conclusion, justify your conclusion, why you want to accept it or why you want to reject it. Even when you are accepting a client, you have to be, you need to be, you need to take a decision from a commercial acumen point of view. You need to ensure that accepting a client is an opportunity, but you cannot accept a client which has a money laundering risk. So even though accepting a client is an opportunity on one side, but if a client is involved in money laundering, look at the commercial acumen. Money, money laundering. I am getting income, but there is a money laundering. Now my decision has to be, I should reject the client because the client is involved in money laundering and it will affect the reputation of my audit firm. It will bring a bad name to my audit firm. And I don't like to associate myself with any bad company. I don't like to do audit of a bad company. So that's, that's what you need to justify. So whenever you are accepting a client, there is an opportunity, but with opportunities, there are threats. So when you are taking a decision, you need to take a holistic one, right? Right, is that clear? See, uh, uh, Nayya Farooqi, uh, don't get into the segregations of skills here, right? That, uh, okay, this is communication, this is analysis, this is judgment, this is skepticism. Uh, just look at the checklist I'm giving you. But if you, if you just keep ensuring this, behind this checklist is communication, analysis, judgment, skepticism, acumen, all of them. But this is about exercising them. It is about demonstrating this checklist. If you're demonstrating, you are gaining most of your 20 professional marks. I've covered the segregation parts, right? Uh, in my individual videos. Uh, I hope you agree with me, Nayya Farooqi. No, Darshan, see, when, when you are accepting a client, and at that point in time, if you know the client is involved in a bad practice, you never accept it because you don't want to start a client with a bad image. Suppose, Darshan, you want to apply for a job, right? And you know the, 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 the job, uh, the company I am applying for a job has a very bad market image. Would you like to work there as your first job? No. So that's, that's the same happens with the auditor, right? Well, the auditor likes to associate with a bad client, do uh, offer service to a bad client. In uh, when you know at the start, it's a bad client. Yes, during the audit, you come to know the client is involved in money laundering, then that's your responsibility to report it to the MLRO. I hope you're clear on that, Darshan. And Najir uh, Farooqi, I hope you're clear with your question as well, right? So we are, we are not going into the segregations of skills. We're going into the checklist of skills, right? That if these skills are implemented, we are impressing. And if you are impressing, we are gaining marks. Next, 13th. 
evaluate going concern matters carefully and its impact on the foreseeable future. If you believe a question comes on going concern, which we have seen a couple of times in the prior history of AAA, evaluate the going concern matters carefully. If you want to calculate a ratio, calculate a ratio. If you want to calculate a trend, do calculate a trend because in a going concern question, the financial information is given. So you can calculate trends and ratios and link them with companies with, you can link them with the foreseeable future of the company. You can link them with threats on the foreseeable future of the company. Because in a going concern question, you need to evaluate whether the company is or is not a going concern. So you have to take a very careful decisions. You have to exercise very careful judgments because there will be numerous matters in the case study which may bring doubt on the going concern status. But remember in a AAA paper, never conclude the company is not a going concern. Have you ever seen a question? Have you ever seen a conclusion in a going concern question in the past paper where the examiner concludes the company is not a going concern? The maximum conclusion is there are material uncertainties relating to going concern. That is the maximum conclusion, right? I hope you agree. Because the student likes to close the company. The student loves to close the company. The student will find one problem in the case and they will say, the company is not a going concern. I don't know why this happened, but this too happens. So it is extremely important that you understand that the multiple factors presented in the case will not close the company, but they will bring a material uncertainty relating to the going concern. They will bring a material doubt on their future, but this will not close the company because the management have future plans. The management have future goals to rectify the problems, to improve the problems, right? Liquidation of a business is, is, is an extreme conclusion. The business will close is an extreme conclusion and is an unprofessional conclusion in the AAA. I've never seen a paper. I, I'm teaching this paper since 2007 and now it's 2022. I have never seen a scenario where the examiner says the company is not a going concern, never. So how would you conclude on saying company is not a going concern just on the basis of 200 or 300 words of a case study? Are you clear with point number 13? Decisions, sound decisions, not harsh decisions. At times you take very harsh decisions on going concern as students. I hope you agree with me. <clears throat> okay, 13th, last two, 14th and 15th. Evaluate whether the assumptions used by management in preparing the forecast are realistic. A lot of time when you get a question on PFI, prospective financial information, lots of assumptions are unrealistic. You need to be critical of assumptions because you know that when the management is preparing a forecast, they are preparing a forecast for taking a bank loan, right? Most of the time in the AAA paper, management is preparing the forecast because they want to take a bank loan. And that is the risk of a management bias. Now, when you know there is a risk of a management bias in a forecasted financial statement, management wants to take a loan, and that is the reason they're preparing a forecast. So most of the assumptions could be unrealistic. The management wants to uh, overstate the cash inflows and understate the cash outflows, or the management wants to overstate the income and understate the expenses if they're preparing a PL forecast or if they're preparing a cash flow forecast. So be critical of the assumptions, challenge the assumptions, be skeptical on the assumptions, uh, exercise careful decisions on the assumptions because that's, that's really important, right? Last, carefully explain the impact on report. Take a sound judgment. If you say a qualified opinion, justify why. If you say adverse opinion, justify why. If you say no impact, justify why no impact. If you say there will be no impact on the opinion, justify why. If you say this, there will be an other meta paragraph in the report, why? Or you say there is an emphasis of a meta paragraph, why? That is extremely important. So just by writing statements, this is an emphasis of a meta paragraph, full stop. You get a technical mark, but not professional. You say the assumption used by management is wrong. You get a technical mark, but not professional mark till the time you justify why it is wrong. You say the accounting treatment used by management is wrong. You might get a technical mark, 
But till the time you explain why the accounting treatment used by management is wrong, you're not getting the professional marks. So the criticality lies in the why. Right? Okay, just let's make a quick final checklist now. Back, my, back to my word file. We were discussing right before the break uh, what the incremental time demands from a student, right? I, I'm just not looking at your questions currently. Uh, the conclusion paragraph, Rajeshwari, I'll be covering uh, in the day two, day three, day four. I'll be guiding about writing conclusions because uh, we will be doing uh, quite a diversified questions starting tomorrow, right? The, the application of what you're learning today will come from tomorrow. So the checklist of 15 uh, will start coming tomorrow and you will see, oh, this is how we have to do it. Uh, I, I'll exactly be demonstrating tomorrow. Uh, what is the word used by the examiner? What is the word used by the examiner, all of you? Demonstrate the professional skills, right? So the demonstration has to come. Yes, I'll be, I'll be guiding about that, Rahul. Introduction is only in the first question. You don't write introductions in any other questions in the AAA paper. Introduction is in the first question. That's only because you're writing a briefing note. Conclusions can be in many questions of the AAA paper. So I'll be very critical of that. Okay, now just listen to me carefully. No questions for the next 10 minutes. We were deciding before the break what the incremental time demands from you, right? And we came to a conclusion that's improving the answer quality. Now, because you have an incremental time, now listen to me very carefully. In the incremental time, incremental time is equal to rise in uh, quality threshold of your answer is equal to rise in uh, marker expectation, uh, rise in marker expectation with the quality of your answer. Just let's bring that first. So incremental time means rise in the marker expectation with the quality of your answer is equal to the rise in quality of your answer. So because examining team is expecting a better answer coming from your side. So with that marker expectation rising on the quality, what is, what is you doing in return? You are rising the quality of threshold of your answer, but how is equal to writing an impressive answer. And this is what I will be controlling over the next three days. What is the definition of this impressive answer? I'll tr I tried my best to give you a definition of an impressive answer today, which is a blend of technical plus professional marks where more important is the professional marks because most of you do gain technical marks somehow but impressive answer is equal to technical plus professional marks or technical and professional marks together technical plus professional skills demonstrated that's where the impressive answer is coming in now try to understand one final thing before we start demonstrating it from tomorrow. When we're looking at the professional skills, right? What is the conclusion? What is the conclusion? I'm not making a list of 15 here, but what is the conclusion? The conclusion is materiality. The conclusion is trends. The conclusion is calculations. The conclusion is uh, calculations. The conclusion is justifications. The why, the why, which is a very important why reasonings, why reasoning, case specific, case specific answer. Uh, there has to be proper uh, impacts, uh, clear impact, sorry, clear impacts, uh, tailored procedures, tailored actions, tailored procedures, tailored actions tailored uh, procedures and actions, uh, prioritizing risk uh, uh, in, in, on significant basis, on significant uh, basis. Now, these are some critical things, right? Materiality, trends, calculations, justifications, why, reasonings, case-specific answers, clear impacts, tailor, tailored procedures and actions, 
conclusions were necessary, conclusions were necessary, uh, challenging, uh, challenging management statements, assumptions, treatments, treatments, etc. Look at this list. This is this is what you need to do right, and I'll be demonstrating this starting tomorrow. This is exactly what you need to do. Yes, even analytical procedures, right? Ratios, trends are part of analytical procedures, right? So is, is, is this becoming clear to all of you, this checklist? Are you trying to absorb some part of this checklist? Are you trying to understand the rigor, rigor behind this checklist? The objective behind this checklist, all of you? It's not remembering the 15. Yes, you can take a print out of that, when you're doing an answer and before you submit this answer to me for checking, you say, okay, uh, have I done this in my answer? Tick, have I done this in my answer? Tick, have I done this in my answer? Tick. And you get an assurance that I will gain most of my 20 professional marks. But if you believe you have not given a reasoning, you have not given a justification, you've not done the calculations, you've not done the materialities, you have not prioritized the risk, you're losing them, right? You're, you're not losing the technical marks, but you're losing the professional marks. And without professional marks, you're not passing. So you, you cannot say zero out of 20 and I'll still pass. Never. This will never going to happen. So please ensure gaining the 20 professional marks is not difficult. It's just about time that you ensure the checklist. It's just about time you improve the quality threshold of your answer. And I'll start giving you the specific applications of these professional marks starting from day two onwards tomorrow, where we'll drill the question one of the mock exam two and three, and you will start to understand. I'll, I'll, I'll show you, see, this is where the professional marks have been exercised. This is where the professional skill have been exercised. This, this is where my quality threshold has improved. So I'll give you an answer, student one answer, Student two answer. Student one answer will get one mark. Student two answer will get two marks. And you say, oh, this is what we have to do. This is the incremental. This is the incremental what we have to bring in our answer. But is everyone clear with this impressive mark summary? Just a short one on your screen currently. Impressive answer is technical plus the professional skills demonstrated. Are you getting this? Great. And are you getting the incremental time? and the rising expectation of the marketing team. Are, is, is that getting to your mindset as well? Great. So is time management clear? And behind the time management, the incremental, incremental time is clear, right? So let's leave the other things for the day to tomorrow when we, when we exercise these skills in a realistic manner and you will get a far better application because over the next three days, your mindset about professional skill will keep improving. So this is not the end of things, right? Okay, the final thing, write study planner. 14 days away is your exam. What you should do now? That's the big question, right? Let's look at the write study planner for September 22 exams. In next 14 days, what are you doing? First of all, need to self-evaluate yourself is important. Sit down today, take a pen and paper, and ask a question to yourself, where are you standing today? Now, each one of you will be different. Some of you must have started the course two months ago, three months ago. Some of you must have started the course just a month ago. Some of you must have had some challenges in between uh, your preparation. Uh, the, there are different situations which could have uh, created hurdles in your progress for the course, etc. But each one of you, if you are going for September exams, honestly ask a question to yourself, where are you standing today? And what's remaining? What's left? What do you need to do? Aim at success. Aim at, I want to pass this time. Set that goal. Because if you're not setting that as goal, you're not passing. Today, make a commitment determination, motivate yourself. I want to pass. Whatever the situation is, I want to pass this time. If you're setting that as a goal, you will do efforts. 
if you're casual with your goal, you say, okay, fine. If I pass, if I fail, let's, let's do my best. No, aim at success. Because if you're not aiming at success, you're not devising the right strategy for next 14 days. Second, where you are standing as, as, of, as of today. As of today, where are you standing? That's critical. Evaluate, see what is remaining. Have you done the practice of the practice exams on the platform? Three practice exams on the platform. One mock exam, have you done it? Have you read the technical articles? Have you read the recent articles? Have you read the current issue? Have you done the mock exam? Look, look at the fill in the blanks here. Ha, have you captured the professional marks? Are you confident on the professional marks? There must be some uh, fill in the blanks remaining, which is to be filled up in the next 14 days for each one of you, right? Knowing your challenges, issues, obstacles, and limitations for next 14 days, how much time you have? You, every one of us face challenges, right? You have to find your own challenges for the next 14 days and then fit a timetable then fit a timetable to be to be successful in the upcoming exam no lame excuses these 14 days is uh, the days which are considered as extremely important devise the right timetable devise the right study time zone you want to study some study late in the night some study early in the morning Know your limitations, know your weak points, know your strengths, do your SWOT analysis. Know your strengths. Can you study early morning? Study early morning. Night, study night. Whichever point of the day you can study, do study. And try to devise the right timetable. Putting the right things in the timetable, I'll just be giving you that list and then you can reconcile your list with my list. This is the list, putting the right list. Watch two previous webinars beside this one, December 21 and June 22. That's just a recommendation, right? If you want to skip December, just want to watch June and September, that's even fine. But if you are a self-study student, December, June, September. If you have taken regular classes, June and September. Recheck your professional marks understanding and each day we'll recheck that. Uh, we recheck it today. Tomorrow, a very different definition of professional marks will come in front of you. Day three and day four. And on day four, we make a final list of what professional marks mean. And you will, you will be amazed how dramatically things have changed under professional marks. So recheck that. Every day you learn uh, over the next four days. But recheck your professional marks understanding. Is there any fill in the blanks? Is there any, is there any vacuum which you still need to fill up over the next 14 days? Read and watch the technical articles, focus on the new ones. So read the new technical articles, the three new technical articles, two for syllabus area F, one for syllabus area C, and one current issue. Have you watched the videos? Not watch them. You need to find the vacuums. You need to find the vacuum which you need to fill up. Practice exam one, have you done it? Tick. Practice exam two, have you done it? Practice exam three for September 22 on the platform. Tick. March, June 22 exam, the most latest one, though it doesn't include the professional mark, but still you have to do the March, June 22 exam. It's on the practice platform. Not, un uh, not under the September 22 uh, bracket, but under the uh, exam past exam library. And please read the examiner report for March, June 22, because by default, this is the latest paper. And you need to read the examiner report as I have guided you in my video analyzing the failure in AAA that you need to keep a red and a green pen and you need to read through the examiner report with the red and green pen, high, uh, tell, uh, high, identifying where the examiner tells about stronger student and weaker student. Everything stronger, green, everything weaker, red. Everything examiner don't want you to do, red. Everything examiner want to do, green. So you will have a lot of red and green analysis, which will have an incremental impact on your marks in the upcoming exam. And the AAA mock exam on the practice platform. This is the checklist for the next 14 days. Now, look at this checklist. All of you, you will have a different answer. Some of you will say, okay, I've done 50% of this. Some say, okay, I've done 40, 30. 
Some say, oh, I've done 75% of it, right? Is everyone having a different answer by looking at this checklist in front of your screen? Is everyone having a different answer to this checklist? But you have to fit this checklist, right? Will you try fitting this in the next 14 days? Right? So a lot of practice, look at how much practice is there. From here to here. This is all practice because practice is the key to success in AAA. Not reading, 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 reading. Reading will not give you anything in the AAA paper. Books, no. It's time to practice. It's time to understand the rigor of the exam. Till the time you're not understanding the rigor of the exam, you will not pass. Right? So please ensure you put this checklist in front of you. Take a print out of that once this presentation gets to you and start your next 14 days agenda. It, it's very, very crucial without wasting time. Now, the last thing. Apart from reading the recent articles, the current issues, the videos I put on the YouTube uh, and rechecking your professional marks understanding, I, I hope uh, if I can ask a question to you, I hope you're getting better with, uh, with better with the professional marks understanding by now. I hope uh, the exercise we even did today uh, are, is helping you with, with uh, the clarity on the professional marks. Is, is that so? Well, leave aside the three days coming from tomorrow. Uh, are you still better on the professional marks? Are you still clear how you have to improve the quality threshold of your answer? Are you still very clear what you need to bring more into your answer now? Okay, that's great. Thank you. Now, the final thing. These are my previous webinars. For your ease, I've given the hyperlinks. This is my June 22 webinar at this hyperlink. This is my December 21 webinar at this hyperlink. Again, depending upon you, you want to watch both or one of them. Uh, again, how much time have you given to my regular course? If you are my regular student, I'll prefer June plus September. If you are a self-study student, I prefer December, June, and September. Right? Okay. Revision of accounting knowledge. Uh, if you still believe you want to revise it, uh, I think I've given a link of some uh, international accounting standards on the WhatsApp group. Again, sharing that link if you forgot that. Uh, to pass the AAA paper, you should have the right accounting knowledge because that accounting knowledge will be helpful in a question on evidence. That accounting knowledge will be helpful in a question on reporting. And that accounting knowledge will be helpful in a question on audit risk and risk of a deal misstatement. So you need the right accounting knowledge. To uh, There is a link given by ACCA for revision of the accounting standards. And I, I did share this link in the WhatsApp group, right? So this is the link here click on this or copy this link or type this link in the web browser and you will reach a very uh, good uh, resource for accounting standards where you can just play the videos and revise these accounting standards. This is a wonderful resource ACC has given us. Yes, the regular students are the one, right, who are registered with me for September course taking my online classes, taking my regular course, right? Those are our regular students. The self-study are the one who are not associated with a teacher or a tutor. Okay, so please revise the accounting standards because that matters a lot in our AAA paper. Uh, Rahul, can you just please put your question again because I'm just focused on concluding the day one of the webinar. If any question is left, put, a, put it on the WhatsApp group and I'll be responding in the morning tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, last thing. Which other articles should I read apart from the new ones? Big question. Because if I tell you read the latest ones, the three latest ones, the current issue, the ones I've done on the YouTube, the student will still ask me, which others? How many of you had this question in mind to ask me, which other articles should I read apart from the new ones? Current issues, the new ones on syllabus area F and C. How many of you had this question in mind? Tell me. Which other article should I read apart from the new ones? Now, I prefer that you read these articles apart from the new ones. Let me show you the list. These articles. 
knowledge based articles not to be missed out. I've taken them from the website where the articles are available. Uh, and I've just taken the same names. Uh, the, these articles are available on the website with the same names. There is an article on the website uh, with laws and regulation as a title. This is a knowledge based article which tells you about auditor responsibility for laws and regulation, what the auditor should do if there is a non-compliance with laws and regulations. And we do know questions for six to eight marks or four to six marks on non-compliance with laws and auditor responsibility or management responsibility keep coming in, the, coming in in the exam paper. Auditor liability, you never know for four to six marks in the upcoming exam. Examiner asks you something about auditor liability. Uh, it's been very long a question has come on auditor liability. Uh, and uh, we've just seen examiner has given us a question on advantages and disadvantages of joint audit, uh, which came after a very long time. So what if this time examiner gives a, us a question on auditor liability? So you should have a reading of the auditor liability article. Uh, group audits, we know component auditors, how the principal auditor interacts with the component auditor, how you use the work of a component auditor. Please do read the article on group audit because again, that's a knowledge article will help you a lot uh, somewhere in the AAA paper. Uh, I've done a YouTube video on the group audits, which is given here. So you can watch it as well. Using the work of internal auditor, that's another article on the website. Again, we know using the work of others is a very frequently asked area in AAA exam. So if you read through it, will benefit. Going concern is another article, a knowledge-based article, which gives you the matters, which may cast doubt on the going concern status, gives you examples of the past paper, Examiner gives you the type of questions which can come on going concern. So again, it's quite a productive article. These are not new articles, right? These are very old articles, but still matter a lot. Uh, auditor report to those charged with governance. That's the title of the article. Again, a very good article where a question comes on communicating to TCWG. So if the examiner asks you a question, matters to be communicated to TCWG or communication to TCWG, which has come a couple of times in the past paper, this article is wonderful. Exposure draft on the proposed revision to the code of conduct. That was quite an old article. Uh, this was a current issue, uh, I think one, one, one and a half years ago. I covered that in my, I think 2021 webinars, but still this is relevant because uh, the testing of this article has been very less. Examiner can still ask you a question for six to eight marks on the proposed revision of the code. And I've already done a session on this uh, almost a year ago. So that shows you this is not nothing new, but you st still should have an idea. And lastly, data analytics. Again, that's an, uh, that's an area which is exploring, emerging. Uh, data analytics has not ended. It's still something new for the auditors. Even though data analytics came one, one and a half year ago and was examined in the past papers, but still you can find some questions on benefits of data analytics, procedures, what sort of procedures the auditor can do using data analytics because that's part of the article. So to be on the safe side, please do watch my video on the data analytics as well. So this is the list of eight articles extra where you should be spending time on and will give you benefit, not, not any disadvantage. So these are proper articles by the AAA examining team and I've tried choosing them with a proper reasoning. So eight articles, plus the three new articles, two on syllabus area F, one on syllabus area C, current issue. So that's four, four plus eight, 12. That's the list in the next 14 days where you have to go through. So this is the knowledge-based articles. We covered down the time, we covered down the time management and making an impressive answer. We covered down a list of core areas in the AAA paper. And this is the day one where I tried focusing on the new developments, time management, professional marks and study approach. I hope you did benefit it from the first day, all of you. And if you can just quickly drop a quick feedback, how was the first day? Did you manage to learn something? Was it beneficial? Uh, did it provide you something you, you didn't knew about it before? And did it provide you the right motivation? Before I just close my first day, and meet you back tomorrow. The recording of this first day will be uploaded on the YouTube for all of you, along with the link of the Google Drive, where I will be putting the day one resources presentation and the Word file. And every day I keep updating the Google Drive for day two, day three, and day four. And I'll be sharing the link of the Google Drive 
uh, when I put the video on the YouTube. And when you read the description of the video, in that description of the video, you will find the Google Drive link as well. And I'll be sharing it on the WhatsApp group as well. Don't worry about it. Okay, thank you so much for your feedback. Uh, it's nice to look at these good words. But at the, at the end of the day, I believe uh, this would uh, favorably impact you. That's, that's more important, right? Right, so Hanan did ask the question, which other articles we should read. Uh, I've already responded to that. And uh, I will try, I will put this on the portal as well, right? So, great. So thank you so much, all of you for joining the live day one of the webinar, uh, Webinar to Success for Advanced Audit and Insurance for September 22 exams. And I'll be back with the day two tomorrow. And the focus of the day two is the question number one of the mock exam for September 22, and a very unusual requirement, which came in the question number one of the March, June 22 exam would also come under study. So an unusual requirement, uh, from the March, June 22 exam, question number one, and the mock exam. So I'll meet you back sharp 7 p.m. Pakistan Standard Time tomorrow. Uh, take good care of yourself. Have a nice day. I wish you all success and see you back tomorrow. I'm Kashif Kamran, your tutor, signing off from the day one of the Advanced Audit and Assurance Webinar to Success. Take care, goodbye, and Allah Hafiz. Any messages and left, please drop them on the WhatsApp group and I'll be replying to to them in the next 24 hours. Thank you. Goodbye and Allah Hafiz.